Next up is Jim Malika of Under Armour, SVP of Digital Commerce and Consumer Engagement. Jim is a 25-year vet in marketing, media, and digital commerce. His team is responsible for deepening Under Armour's relationship with consumers across brand experiences and for driving revenue. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me, Andrea. Appreciate it. And I need to get set up with Jeff for the Vitamins Sound Incredible to do a partnership with my fitness pal. That so is perfect. absolutely true. So let's make sure, Andrea, literally do that while I'm on here. Connect these two wonderful dudes. Jim, before we go anywhere, um, your default picture, because the team sends me all this stuff, which yeah. by the way, I still have, I feel so bad because the team does so much prep work for these things. <laughs> and and I, you get, you also know me well. So you yep. and Jeff both know, the last two guests, that I spent 0.0, .0 seconds prepping for these things. <laughs> but when I tell you, that when I saw your default photo, I guess it's your <laughs> LinkedIn photo, that young man, <laughs> that is a good looking young man. Oh. Uh, default photo. You might have to update it, brother. You, yeah. you gotta be careful because when the default <laughs> photo is 30 years younger than you actually are, you, you, you're, gonna, you're yeah. such a good looking dude. You look so great right now for your age, but you're getting people caught because they see that default <laughs> photo and they think you're, that you're the son of you. Yeah, yeah, I love it. In fact, though, that was taken a few years ago, but still at Under Armour. There's just a lot of Vaseline and uh, Photoshop, my friend. Yeah, you look yeah. insane, bro. I think you should quit. <laughs> forget this and become a model. All right, give us, give us the context of your career so we set you up and then we'll go into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, um, the, the short story, grew up in, in an Italian neighborhood in, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, family from New York, New Jersey, we spent a lot of time up there. My dad was the first to go to college. And so, you know, uh, for me, and, and he went to law school, became successful. They had me young, became successful. And so I always felt that I was going to have to follow in his footsteps and be an attorney. My mother from a very creative and artistic family, there was something that just didn't feel right about it. So I was actually in law school for a day, literally one day. One day. Uh, one day. I, uh, I moved back home. I went to, went to law school for one day, came home, told my father, uh, I'm dropping out. And, and uh, I packed how'd, up. How'd, how'd that go? I packed up my shit and found an apartment uh, <laughs> right away. But I did. I walked across the street and started in business school. <clears throat> and it was right for me, right? It just didn't feel right. I felt a lot of pressure to succeed as the oldest of three boys. I felt like that was the path that I should take. You were the but, oldest of three. I was the oldest of three. Oh my God. I wish I was friends with one of your two younger brothers. They must have been so pumped when you quit law school on day one. They're like, great. Oh my God. Nothing yeah. we can all do is worse off. than that. Yeah. Right. All, all pressure was off. All yeah. pressure was off. So I went, uh, I got recruited out of business school, went to Nissan. Um, mostly I think because my dad had a green 240Z when I was a kid. And I think I was trying <laughs> to ingratiate myself back with him. Um, and the whole internet started, right? And this was before there was a commercial internet, but they put me on this project. I realized that was gonna fundamentally change the way that we interact with brands. So I quit, took you know, uh, half the money, moved across the country and started in a dot-com, you know, first wave of dot-coms. And um, that started this path of, let me go learn everything I can about things that I find interesting that uh, you know, I think are gonna change the way we do business. And if I felt like if I learned more and I knew it and I had hands on, hands on practical experience, then I controlled my own destiny. And so that's why it's you know, allowed me to work for, and I've been fortunate enough to work for some of the brands that I have. I love that. And, and, and w just for four seconds, yeah. Nissan, which companies, just to, to the point you are so, now? So I went Nissan, I went to a startup, um, I, I went to a financial services startup, then I went to another uh, data and analytics company, which then got bought by private equity and Newstar. Then Disney, Viacom, which uh, I worked with, worked with and for Pam, who you see next, next, right? Fantastic leader. Um, and then went on to Ralph Lauren and now Under Armour. Something that you and I have talked about in the past is vulnerability yeah. as a strength. This yep. was probably the combo that kind of like locked me in with you because I believe in it so much. Even though I don't, you know, I, I've learned that it's not that I worry about vulnerability, it's that I don't love to put my, my headaches on other people. So I myself never demonized vulnerability. I demonized everybody has their own shit too. And I'm so grateful that my chemicals let me take care of my stuff. So I'm not gonna put this on them. I'm gonna be an agent of positivity and good vibes. Why put more garbage on people? And I continue to be that way, but 
I try to find ways to show vulnerability, especially now that more eyes are on me. I'm like, wait, let me show that like, yeah. I, have, I have bad, every day I have issues given what I'm up to in life and business. Talk to me about that because that always struck me when we talked about that back in the day. And I think it's a pillar that you've been yeah. thoughtful about. Yeah, look, I mean, I think, I think that humanizes you, right? Um, to which Jeff's earlier point of your question about like the, the comet, I don't think the comet's ever sustainable because people know that they're out for themselves, right? Right. And while they may be good guys to get a drink with or, or shoot around an idea, you know that, the, that they don't have an interest in creating meaningful relationship and helping the, you know, the two of you to connect to build something better. And so for me, you know, I've always felt like uh, one of the things that is really, really important is not pretend you have all the answers because nobody does. And if, you, and if you start to elicit the opinions of others, if you start to talk about all the things that you've screwed up over the years, it lets people have the freedom then to number one, engage in better creativity, going to different places of innovation that they wouldn't because they'd be afraid of otherwise. But it also makes you feel like, like you're a totally um, human person to them and that they can relate to you. And for me, like, I can't put on, I, I'm like you, I'm very transparent. I am who I am. And, and you're going to get- but I, but I will say, I will say, and this might help some people, I am that, but I am much better at 44 than I was at 34 at saying, hey, can you explain that? I didn't understand that acronym or this, you know, it, it's just the truth. I, I would never, I was always, pet, I always lived my life that everybody was filming everything and could I explain what played out? And it's really- guided me so well. So I wouldn't make pretend I knew something. By the way, one of the biggest things I teach with my own team is when I know somebody doesn't know what they're talking about and I go really at it. And then I, and then I make them feel safe, but I, but I teach them that they could get caught. Yeah. You know, like don't like, so I feel at 44 versus 34, I'm much more comfortable saying, Hey, can you explain that? I don't fully know it. Whereas at 34, I'd let it go by and try to figure it out later. And that speaks to vulnerability in a different form. It's not faking the funk, yeah. but it's leaning into it. Well, because you were trained, we as people are trained that way. That yeah. if you don't have the answer, you don't know that's a mortal flaw. <laughs> right. And I think, it, and I, and I think what, what ends up happening is, is that if you not just explain it, but you actually ask the quote unquote dumb question, the obvious, like, help me understand what that You're helping means. everybody else in the room. Yeah, exactly. Because then they feel like, well, they can ask the question too. Um, and, and I think uh, it's your point. Like, there are lessons learned over time, right? I think I've become much better about this where, you know, when, when you first start your career, when I first started my career, I thought it was really important to make sure that everybody knew how much I knew. And then you realize, you, you realize that, that that's not actually the way to build relationships and ultimately succeed in what you're trying to accomplish. It's a really, it's a really interesting point. I, I've been thinking a lot of, so I love to talk, but I realized something about myself was because I really didn't care what anybody thought about me. It was that I like to use it as a guide to get to the actual answers. Yeah. The thing that I've realized about myself in meetings is I don't like waste. Like I think every meeting is 80% too long and 40% overcrowded. And now what I'm trying to do instead of doing what I do, which is dominate a room to get to the punchline, which could be perceived wrong. I'm like, I'm going to start creating smarter agendas and shorter meetings. And it's helped me. It's helped me not talk as much. This goes back to the vulnerability of self-awareness, which was like, I didn't need to, like nobody in my company needs to think they know what, what we're doing here. It was that I was trying to get to the punchline because I didn't like the waste. Totally. Well, and that, that brings you to what, what I, at least what I found during this time, during COVID and staying at home, right? That everyone, I was worried, getting ready to replatform and launch a new website, getting ready to, to, to launch a new loyalty program in China. And everybody is, is in these you know, diverse locations all over the world. And I thought, there's no way in hell we're going to launch these complex things. Because, you know, I'm an office guy. I'm a people person. And, you know, I like to burn the midnight oil and be there late. And I was worried that we'd lose productivity. But what I found what, is... the other way? Yeah, same, totally. Same. By the way, same. To because, because what I found is, is that Zoom's really productive when everybody's on Zoom. I found that, that you know, you don't get invited to all the bullshit meetings that don't matter to oh, your point. It's, it's 
people are cutting them down to, you know, 15, 30 minutes. And and by the way, everybody that cares about relationships, the one that was the most not obvious to me, for example, I, I've had the luxury and adore you and our, and Pam who comes up next. And hopefully after we get the jam some more Molly as well. And in the future, like, and you know, Pam, you definitely know this. I know you're in the back room, but I can see you. I've probably, and vice versa, have tried to get together with Pam in the last 18 months, 11 times. And we might be one of 11, right? No, 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 I'm not. I'm, I'm saying it in a good way, Pam. I know nobody sees you when you said you're full of shit, which I love about her. That's why she's the best. What I mean by that is people are busy and calendars are hard. And I have found that I feel more confident that I'm going to be able to check in and jam 15 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Like, I feel like it's going to be a gateway to relationships. Like when we go back to normal, I think the Zoom virtual ecosystem, even the way people are, now people want it. You know, I, because of all the rap kids and all the athletes with my brother, that crew only wanted to do FaceTime calls, right? right. Like four years ago when all these 18 year olds were like, FaceTime calling me, I'm like, what are they doing? Like, I was even like, I like to be progressive. Like, shit, this is not like exactly how I do it. Now that's what everybody's gonna be doing because we're so used to this for, I was on a phone call last week and hung up and said, I'm not doing this. That's how much I didn't like the conference call. I was like, can we please reschedule this? Cause the context of the reactions, like Pam's reaction in the back room, like I need that shit. That's how I breathe. And I know you're that way too, Jim. Yeah, and it's your environment. Look, like the fact that we're in our environments and my dog may come in or my kids are all over here and they may come in and ask me for something. There's a humanity to it, Gary. and It breaks down that wall of we're somebody different between work and here and your point about understanding and empathizing humans. I think that window into the world has re- at least it's really, really helped me. Set boundaries, yeah. stay recharged. Um, but yeah, love the conversation and, and, and uh, you got a killer coming up next. I'm aware of that. Thank you, brother. We just had a killer. Great seeing All you. Right. Take care. Take care. Great seeing you. Bye-bye.